all who are joining us and thank you for your patience with our delay today. Uh, this is the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's update on COVID-19 for NYC healthcare providers. As always, you've been placed in listen-only mode, so if you have questions during the presentation, please submit them via the Q&A portion of the WebEx, and we will address them at the end as time allows. The slides from the webinar, as well as the recording of the event, will be made available on the provider page of our website by tomorrow afternoon. And we also thank you, as always, uh, for your participation in a brief poll at the end of the webinar. Today, our discussion will center on the recent recommendation to pause use of Johnson & Johnson Johnson COVID-19 vaccine, as well as SARS-CoV-2 variants from implications for New York City. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Jane Zucker to speak more about that recommendation to pause the use of the j, &J vaccine. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, move ahead to my slides, please. Okay, next slide. Uh, so I just wanted to start my uh, presentation um, by showing uh, where we are with COVID-19 vaccine administration in New York City. Um, and this is data from yesterday. But what's really amazing is that today we're up over 5.5 million doses. There were um, over 100 million doses reported since yesterday. Um, and if we look at uh, vaccination coverage, if we look at adults, so 18 plus, 45% of New York City residents 18 and older have gotten at least one dose of vaccine and 29% are fully vaccinated. Um, and then the numbers that are provided on the slide are for the all New York City residents. So that does in, include um, children, which um, we hope um, more teens will soon uh, be able to be uh, vaccinated I'm expecting the EUA for Pfizer to uh, change soon. So I think um, this is a great progress uh, since the initial availability of vaccines. Next. So uh, just a word uh, about the Johnson & Johnson um, Janssen vaccine. It is a genetically modified adenovirus vector vaccine that contains DNA, which encodes for the SARS <clears throat> excuse me, COVID-2 spike protein. Um, the vaccine received emergency use authorization by the FDA on February 27th. And through April 12th, there had been over 6.8 million doses of this vaccine administered in the United States. On April 13th, uh, the CDC and FDA re recommended a pause in use of this vaccine to investigate um, reports of a rare and severe type of blood clot in six um, individuals who had received this vaccine. The cases had been reported through the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, uh, better known as VAERS, really from um, toward the end of March through early April. Um, and in response um, to the CDC and FDA announcement, the um, Health Department sent out a notice to providers and facilities um, who had this vaccine to uh, pause its use during this, uh, while the review process uh, was starting. Uh, the following day on April 14th, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices met to review these cases and assess their significance. Um, and, and so what's notable, the, uh, the committee did not vote, um, did not actually propose a vote on whether to continue using the uh, j, j vaccine at this time or their options would have been to recommend to continue using it according to the EUA, uh, recommend more narrow use, for example, with an age-based recommendation or recommend not using it. So they did neither. Um, they um, decided they needed more time, so no vote, which is essentially continuing the pause. And they did request um, additional data to assess uh, the risk um, of these uh, blood, of the thrombolic events um, in the interim before they meet again. Next. Um, so uh, this is a summary of the characteristics of the six uh, patients that have been reported, right? And we're, and we're specifically um, talking about cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or CVST associated with thrombocytopenia. And that's part of the sort of hallmark of the, uh, the syndrome that they're seeing. So all of these patients were white women. Uh, the median age was 33. 
their onset of symptoms were between uh, 6 to 8, 13 days after vaccination. The median was um, 8 days. The initial presenting symptoms were headache in 5 patients. And then in the 6th back pain, which was then followed by headache um, for that 6th patient. Um, there were other symptoms, which included focal neurologic symptoms in 4 patients. All were diagnosed with CBSC by intracranial imaging. Three also had um, thrombo thromboses, which were identified in other large vessels, which are outside the cerebral circulation. All had thrombocytopenia. Um, four developed brain hemorrhage, and one subsequently died. And there was no obvious pattern of comorbid conditions, which were detected. Next. Um, so um, the, these reports of thrombotic events um, with the J and J <clears throat> Janssen vaccine um, are similar to reports of, of similar events um, after receipt of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which were reported um, in Europe. Um, both of these vaccines um, are adenovirus vector vaccines, um, coding the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. But just to point out the difference, the J and J vaccine is a human non-replicating human adenovirus vector while the AstraZeneca uses um, a chimpanzee adenovirus vector. Um, studies of patients with immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia after the AstraZeneca vaccine in Europe um, suggest that these events may be associated with platelet activating antibodies, specifically against platelet factor four. And so as with heparin induced thrombocytopenia, Heparin should be avoided in, in these patients with possible vaccine associated immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia unless testing um, is for these antibodies are negative. And I will say that this was part of the concern and the reason for the pause uh, because um, the syndrome may not be readily recognized, and usual treatment would be with heparin. And um, the CDC and FDA thought it was just critical to inform the, the uh, medical community um, about uh, what they were seeing so that these patients could be treated properly. So the treatment recommendations are to use non-heparin anticoagulants, high dose intravenous immune globulin, and a consultation with hematologists, hematology specialists are strongly recommended. I know we are expecting um, the National Association for Hematology um, to be issuing um, guidance. Um, I'm, I'm told that that should be today. Next. Um, so these are the key steps for providers. Um, one, right, do not administer the J&J &J Janssen vaccine pending further guidance. Um, we ask that you store the vaccine properly in the interim, and that operational guidance has been sent to all providers um, who have received uh, the J and J vaccine. Um, remain vigilant for symptoms of possible serious thrombotic events um, or thrombocytopenia. Uh, J and J uh, COVID-19 vaccine recipients. Again, symptoms may include severe headache, backache, new neurologic symptoms, severe abdominal pain, uh, dyspnea, leg swelling, petechiae, or new or easy uh, bruising. It's important um, to obtain platelet counts and screen for immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia. Um, so in patients with thrombosis and thrombocytopenia after this vaccine, again, evaluate um, by screening with platelet factor for and, and using an ELISA the enzyme-linked um, immunosorbent assay, not the latex assay. Consult with a hematologist, and again, do not treat with heparin um, unless uh, testing for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is negative. It is critical to report um, these events, as well as all serious and life-threatening adverse events to VAERS. And just to note that this is a requirement as part of the um, provider agreements uh, to receive COVID-19 vaccine. Next. Um, so this is just information about how to report to VAERS. The easiest way to do it is um, on their website. There's a, a form that you would fill in. 
Um, but there is also um, the 800 number and an email um, if you do need assistance as well as the video instructions and you will have this um, available to you. And um, I think it's, I would suspect most people who are vaccinating um, are well, are, are very familiar with the VARIS website. Um, one question that has come up is that, um, just to note that HIPAA permits reporting of protected health information to public health authorities, including CDC and FDA, because when they get a report, both CDC and FDA are reaching out to the provider to get as much information as possible, as quickly as possible. So we ask for your cooperation with that. Um, and again, know that this is legally permitted. Next. Um, so just a word about where the health department has uh, distributed the J&J vaccine. So it's been sent to hospitals specifically for administration to inpatients who are being discharged um, to consider use in emergency departments um, and for off-campus ambulatory care sites. Again, given that it was a one-dose vaccine, it was sort of well-suited for this purpose. Um, federally qualified health centers have gotten vaccines. Um, the J&J &J vaccine, um, as well as independent medical providers. I will say it's quite disappointing because with um, our J&J &J allocation and with the less restrictive storage requirements, we had actually done a fairly large distribution to men, like over 100 independent medical providers, especially those in, in priority neighborhoods. Um, and that was an important step in expanding access. Um, so that, um, is obviously um, they're not able to use that vaccine. We were also using this vaccine for special populations, for example, vaccination programs in the homeless shelters, um, also to reach people um, who are homeless as well um, as used in our uh, homebound program. The vaccine has also been used for long-term care facilities, as well as in mass vaccination and pop-up clinics. Um, so there were clinics that were being done at NYCHA sites, at NORC, for naturally occurring retirement communities, as well as at Houses of Worship. Uh, many pharmacies um, have received J&J &J vaccine from the federal government. And we had actually just um, started distributing vaccine to university and college student health centers um, to vaccinate their faculty and students, and especially the students before uh, the semester ended. So all this is obviously on hold. Next. Um, so, the, obviously, all our shipments of the vaccine, because we did have orders in with CDC, those are on hold, and we're unable to place any new orders um, until the pause would be lifted. Um, most New Yorkers who made appointments for the J&J Janssen vaccine will be offered Pfizer or Moderna. Uh, many sites, and especially the city sites, have sort of pivoted to be able to, to, be able to offer another vaccine or to rebook uh, patients um, at another clinic that have uh, one of the mRNA vaccines, um, but obviously some vaccination activities will be on hold during the interim, and we are assessing which programs can use the mRNA vaccine products as an alternative. Um, specifically, um, we will be able to move forward with our homebound program using the Moderna vaccine, um, as well as, um, you know, some of the other more limited programs. But of course, we are limited by available supply, both for Pfizer um, and Moderna, and we're not able to send another vaccine to all of those providers who had received um, the J&J &J vaccine. Next. So just to touch on a few other updates, um, in New York State, all residents 16 years of age and older are, no, are now eligible for COVID-19 vaccination. Um, we still ask you to prioritize your patients who are 65 and older um, and people with underlying medical conditions as they um, are at risk, increased risk for severe COVID-19 um, if they did get infection. Um, for people who are 16 or 17, Pfizer vaccine is the only currently approved product. Um, if they're going to a city site um, or, you know, not getting vaccinated um, by their regular provider, um, they will need identification to verify they're at least 16 or have their parent or guardian present to attest um, to this. The state is requiring parent or guardian consent at the time of vaccination, and this needs to be done either in person or can be done via telephone. And more information about the eligibility criteria 
are, is provided um, on that link. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Sorry, we have one more. I believe. Um, so just the other update, just to give you information about where the real world interim estimates of effectiveness. I think what's really exciting is all of the um, information that's coming out is showing that the vaccine is um, is effective in in uh, use in various settings. So uh, one study demonstrated, um, and this was done by CDC, and this was looking at first responders, healthcare personnel, and frontline workers. And um, the mRNA vaccines were 90% effective against COVID-19 um, infection, regardless of symptoms. Um, as well as this was after full immunization and um, even after one dose was 80% effective. Um, Israel, uh, they've published a case control study showing that two dose effectiveness after the Pfizer mRNA vaccine uh, was 80%, 87% effective against hospitalization and 92% effective against severe disease. Um, and the effectiveness in preventing COVID-19 associated death was 72%. Um, and in the in England, there was an observational analysis which showed a 42% reduction in hospitalization among patients age 80 and older um, who had received their first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so all good news um, coming out of uh, use use of the vaccine um, in multiple settings. Next, um, so this is really I want to ask everyone's help on the call, all of the providers. Um, we hear over and over again, you know, that people want to hear from their medical providers. Um, this has come out of various health opinion poll surveys, um, and we know from other vaccination programs that the most critical um, sort of factor for someone agreeing to get a vaccine is a strong provider recommendation, and so that's where we need your help. Um, for facilities that have received vaccines, schedule your patients for vaccination. Again, prioritize all those who are age 65 and older. Um, for facilities that haven't received vaccine yet or are not planning to receive vaccine, um, you can still play an important role by helping uh, your patients to make appointments. And those can either be done online at the New York City Vaccine Finder or at the 877-VAX for NYC um, phone number. I will say that um, obviously it had been um, difficult to get appointments um, earlier on, but there are appointments that are readily available and that should um, no longer be um, sort of the rate limiting step for your patients to get vaccinated. Next, I think that was, so this is just um, summary slide to end my presentation. So again, out of um, caution, use of the J&J &J vaccine was paused um, promptly when the thrombotic events um, were identified so that there can be an investigation. Um, the risk for those who may have already received this vaccine um, is very low. Um, and then there have been no reports of cerebral, um, of CVST with thrombocytopenia among the more than 180 million recipients of either of the mRNA vaccines. Um, safety monitoring of all vaccines is ongoing. And as we learn more information, we will certainly um, share it as soon as we get it. Um, and we need you to strongly uh, recommend COVID-19 vaccination for your patients. Again, focus on those uh, for severe disease. And I will stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Zucker. Uh, and this is Dr. Ray coming back again. Apologies for being late. Um, we are now going to move to our second exciting part of the presentation uh, where we're going to discuss um, a very hot topic, which is SARS-CoV-2 variants and the potential implications for New York City. And can you advance the slide, please? Uh, so just as a little bit of background before we uh, get our primary speakers uh, in, so SARS-CoV-2 uh, is a virus that mutates regularly changes in its genome, uh, which result in variants, are expected um, after emerging. Some variants will persist, some will disappear. Uh, we don't know 100% why some persist, um, but you know, one of the common, uh, common theories is that there is some viruses may have an evolutionary advantage, particularly increased transmissibility, so that if a virus uh, can infect 
more people, it is more likely to survive wars uh, and might overtake a virus that uh, does not infect as many. Uh, we have just a couple terms here for you um, from the CDC. A variant of concern is a variant that has one or more concerning characteristics uh, that will be changing in changes in receptor binding, reduced neutralization by vaccine or prior infection-related antibodies, reduced efficacy uh, or treatment efficacy, uh, increased transmissibility or disease severity, diagnostic test detection failure, um, and those are all those are all concerning uh, practical ways in which a variant, you know, which we can classify, use to classify a variant. Variants of interest are um, contain genetic markers that have been associated with those concerning characteristics, um, but we don't have evidence yet to show that that variant actually has a clinical, has the same clinical impact. So it is likely in variants of high consequence um, have clear evidence that prevention measures or medical countermeasures have significantly reduced effectiveness against them. And just as a point, and we've already seen some questions, we've already seen some questions about this, but uh, none of the existing SARS-CoV-2 variants that we are aware of currently meet this definition. And can you advance the slide, please? Uh, this is just a slide from the CDC looking at the national picture um, of various variants. Um, I encourage you to take a look at this slide closely after the presentation, uh, but the purpose of illustrating this slide is to show that uh, each of these bars represents a different week and each of the colors represents a different variant. And it's just showing that the overall makeup and the relative percentages of variants prevalence in a community can change from week to week. And you'll hear a lot more about that during our presentation. Um, and can you advance the slide, please? Hi there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Go sorry. ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Hughes. I was just going to say now we're going to hear about whole genome sequencing uh, from Dr. Scott Hughes from the New York City. Hi there. I'm Scott. Get, uh, can everybody hear me okay? If you can't, just uh, say something in the chat and I'll try to speak more clearly and loudly. This is a picture of our old building, circa 1960. Um, hopefully, we'll be moving to a new building, COVID permitting, in the next uh, few years. Uh, the next slide is animated, so you want to click through. Well, at least I get the effect. Oh, well. So anyway, there's been a lot of stories about variants of concern, variants, mutants. Um, this, this slide here was supposed to go along with a lot of other articles that were appearing. But you can see there, there's 650 million results from Google. So this is more than Kim Kardashian, actually. So uh, it's, it's in the news a lot. So what we're going to try to talk about today is some of the lingo that's being used. Uh, I know it's a lot of jargon. So I'm going to try to make that a little more clear so that when you read these news articles, it makes a little more sense. Uh, next slide. So, uh, you know, getting into the weeds a little bit with, you know, this is just a 3D model of, of, of the virus. Um, you see sort of a a cutaway. So inside is the viral RNA, and then outside is are these viral membrane proteins. They're really protecting the virus, the viral RNA, which is really what the purpose of the virus is to get into the cell and make more of itself. So the sort of magenta pinkish uh, proteins, the spike proteins, the S gene proteins that they're, they're commonly referred to, that's how the virus latches itself onto the cell. So, then, so it, it attaches very specifically to a receptor. And so as part of that protein, the S protein, there's a receptor binding domain, the RBD. So within this receptor binding domain, there's about four or 500 amino acids. And so these amino acids that are there are all in very key positions that can affect the virus's ability to latch onto its receptor. And some of these mutations that you read about that are of concern because they may allow the virus to uh, bind more readily to its receptor, which could increase uh, transmission, they allow the virus possibly to evade, you know, antibody binding, which, you know, evade neutralization. So, you know, and some of these mutations can do both. So these mutations are, which I'll go into a little bit of discussion further on, appear sort of appear in actually many of these different variants of concern, which is an example of convergent evolution. So next slide. So a little bit about the genomic characteristics of the virus. So we have to know that before we can start to understand all the whole genome sequence. 
uh, data that's coming out. So it's, it's, as far as RNA viruses go, coronaviruses are really big. The typical RNA virus is between five and 10,000 bases. So the coronaviruses are about three times bigger than that. They're pretty complex. They've got a lot of proteins. So you know, right now we're talking mostly about the spike when we're thinking about variants, but in the future, you'll probably start reading more about different proteins that are also mutated that give the virus an advantage, especially when it comes to the early part of infection and evading the, the innate immune response, such as, which is led by the interferon cytokine. Um, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of, of effort to do sequencing in SARS-CoV-2. It's really unprecedented. So far, there's over 200,000 genomes that are available publicly. Um, another key point about the virus is that it, because it is so big, uh, you know, mutations are generally bad. Uh, so they create stop codons, they create uh, proteins that don't work. So the virus is trying to limit that. So it does have what's called a proofreading mechanism that's not as not as effective as that in mammalian cells, but it, but it allows it to, to mutate less frequently. Um, so it's about half that of influenza and a quarter of that of HIV. So, so whole genome sequencing is really used to identify these mutations that, are cre that create these variants from what was really referred to as original strain that came out of Wuhan, China. Um, as I just said, most mutations really have no effect or they can be bad for the virus, but a few of them give a selective advantage, which allows it to spread more quickly. Um, and so the answer to these variants is based on different mutations and genetically similar SARS-CoV-2 isolates, this is a technical term now that you'll hear by lineage name. So you see this B117, B1526. So these are all the, sort of the lingo that's being used right now. So within a common lineage, there can, there can be these mutations that are associated with, as I said, receptor binding, antibody neutralization, or vaccine breakthroughs. So the examples would be is N501Y, so that, or E48K. So that means that in place of the, the wild type N, there's now a, a, a mutated 501Y position, or in the case of uh, 484, which is present in the 526 variants, or otherwise known as New York, now there's a lysine at that location. The next slide. Okay, so whole genome works, sequencing workflows. How does it relate to you all? So from our end, what we're going, what we would ask from you is these are the specimen requirements. So typically, we use respiratory swabs and viral transport media. It could be uh, other uh, respiratory uh, 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 sources or, or specimens, saliva, sputum. Uh, but one thing is the standard is the storage condition. So really, the virus is not that stable at room temperature or even four degrees. So after three days. Uh, Samples, if they haven't been sent to the lab uh, for, for whole genome sequencing, should be frozen at minus 70 for longer periods. Another key part of this is if most of you are doing PCR or, or nucleic acid application testing, NAT testing, the positive specimens that are, that are above 30 to 32 are really not useful to us because there's not really much material. So we're really looking for uh, specimens that have a cycle threshold value of less than 30 to 32. So that allows us to successfully sequence a viral genome from those specimens. Now, whole genome sequencing itself is a multi-step process. It's sort of represented graphically on the right of this slide. So when we receive the specimen, we have to do an extraction to get the RNA out of, out of, the, uh, out of the specimen. We have to do some technical things with, re with regard to the whole genome sequencing process because on you know, expensive instruments, and that can take a matter of hours or days. And then there's a very complicated bioinformatics process. You're getting millions and millions of pieces of data that need to be stitched together and into a coherent picture. Um, so, you know, as I said, it's a multi-step process. It can take as much as a week. Uh, there are new methodologies that are reducing this workflow to as little as two or three days. Um, it, sort of quick fact, there's a company called Oxford Nanopore. They make a device called the MinION. Uh, so it's spelled like Minion. So if you type in Google it, you'll, you'll come up with a picture of Minions. But if you search a little deeper, you'll find the MinION. This could actually fit on a palm of a hand. So this is the next generation of sequencing technology. So regardless, sequencing is very expensive. So this is not something that uh, most facilities will, will take, uh, take up, um, you know, a run. You know, whether you do one specimen or 40 specimens, it's still going to cost you almost $4,000. Um, so you can, you can imagine doing even 100 specimens a week, that starts to add up. Um, now, the bioinformatics part, this, this really does take a trained uh, bioinformatician. It also requires computer scientists. There's a lot that goes on with this. Um, so, you know, they're using these open source uh, and locally developed software tools. 
And so this all comes together with, with the, the lingo is this pipeline. So you, you run your sequence through a pipeline and out comes, uh, you know, a, sort of an analysis of the sequence to say you have mutations in X, Y, or Z gene. Uh, another, another tool that's used that's actually very important, it's called pangolin, which kind of uh, play on words because pangolins were actually originally thought to be the source of, of, their, of SARS from, uh, from animals to humans. But this stands for phylogenetic assignment of named global outbreak lineages. Um, so, but anyway, this is an open source tool that's used to assign these lineage names, these very complicated B1526. Now, this is a key thing to note here. Pangolin is updated based on new data. So it's like based on machine learning. So what you thought was your B1526 today, next week, based on a new, new update, the software tool could become B1526.2. So it, it, it may not be the same virus. It may not even have the same characteristics. But, but phylogenetically, this is, this is how it's being assigned. So the next slide. So um, before I move on to some of the, you know, showing you examples of phylogenetic trees, none of this could be possible without really this, this overwhelming and phenomenal uh, global effort, collaborative effort between uh, two, it's really two major organizations with networks. So, the first is GISAID. It actually started in 2008, and it, it stands for Global Initiative on Sharing Avian Influenza Data. Um, so there's a little bit of controversy whether it's GISAID or GISAID, you know, GIF for GIF, but I think because it's global, it should be GISAID. So this is a public domain initiative. Like I said, it was established in 2008. And so this, this sort of site allows us to put our raw sequencing data, or our consensus genome sequencing data on it, so that then it's publicly available for other researchers to look at. So if you, you know, generally speaking, you know, from a scientific perspective, if you're doing sequencing, you should make it available to the rest of the world. Uh, so a lot of key insights were determined based on that publicly available uh, data. Uh, next slide. So if you were, if you were to go on to GISAID and you would just see, uh, you know, basically genomic sequence, A, T, G, C, T, G, Z, it really wouldn't make any sense. So to make sense of it visually, um, we use NextStrain. So again, this is a global collaboration that uh, provides an open source, you know, analytic and visual visualization tools to, to really allow us to, to, to start to learn more about the virus. So in our case, we can take our PHL data that we sequence here and match it up against the global GSA data and see how so you can see on the right there, there's an example of the spread of the virus, with these different lineages, you know, going around the world. And then, and then there's also an example of a phylogenetic tree, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. So this is an example of what, you know, you take GISA data, you, you then run it through uh, NextStrain, and then NextStrain, you know, this is one of the many ways you can visualize data on NextStrain. So this is an example of a phylogenetic tree. So it's over time, the far left is the beginning of the pandemic to current times on the far right. Um, each one of these branches represents what is sort of the, the backbone of what's going on worldwide. And then the little dots, you know, the purple and orange and, and, and so on dots, those represent unique New York City sequences that are on GISAID. So as you can see at the beginning of the outbreak, um, there were many cases that were being sequenced. Um, it's as far as the lower left hand of the, of the uh, diagram is actually the, the original Wuhan strain, so as you can see. Um, over time, it's, it's basically dissipated and these new variants are starting to emerge. As some of you may note that there's less dots in the middle. That's just a reflection of less cases and less sequencing going on in New York City during that summer period. So as we can see now, you know, where sequencing is ramped up or where uh, there's more awareness of these variants. We have, I've just highlighted two uh, major variants that are in the news. It should be B117. Um, that's the UK variant. So you can see that that cluster of, of sort of bluish dots did not really start appearing until the, uh, in New York City until the beginning of the year, which makes sense because it was first seen in the UK in sort of November, December of 2020. And now we also have our own variant, Z1526. So that, you, again, you don't see it, you know, earlier in the pandemic, but over time as the virus evolved, now you see the emergence of that particular variant in, in late December, in, in December, and now is with sequencing increasing, there's more and more cases being detected. Next slide. So again, you'll, you'll, you'll hear about the different variants and the different mutations associated with it. So 
So within the B1526 lineage, there can also be sublineages that, that have specific mutations. So in this case, with 526, there's this mutation at the 484 position, which is of concern because it's been, it's, it's at least in the laboratory setting, it's been shown to, to be involved in receptor binding and, and antibody uh, escape. So next slide. So this is just, I thought this was a very good diagram that was in The Economist that really takes all this previous data that I've shown you and, and just sort of illustrates that from how the virus evolves over time. So you have this, this A lineage, which is you know, originally started in China, and now you see the emergence of the B lineage in Europe. So if you remember back in March, there was, well, there's a new strain emerging because of this B614G. So that gave rise to really the predominant strain that we see now in the West. Um, so, and with this B1 now starting to evolve through, throughout the world, um, you, you have B117, B1526, and so it in B1351. So, these mutations, if you look at the little boxes there, the, the red boxes indicate the 484 mutation in, in, the, in the sort of greenish teal color, or the 501 mutation. And you see throughout the diagram that even though these viruses are diverging, they all, many of them contain the same mutations, and some of them are actually contained both. So that's, that's, that's really concerning for us. So that's why we continue to do sequencing to just really stay ahead of what's going on. And I will say that a lot of these mutations were predicted months ago in the laboratory. Uh, next slide. So um, many, much of our data is publicly available, uh, as we mentioned earlier. So these are just sort of a, a, a table of some of the variants, the concern variants of interest that we're following. Um, you know, we try to avoid associating these variants with, with the location, so that's why we, we mostly refer to them by their lineage name. Um, you know, most of their, their potential concerns revolve around, you know, more, trans, more transmissible, possibly more lethal, um, and reduction in, in antibody neutralization. So, and then just on the right is, is a link to uh, publicly available uh, data that we publish weekly from the New York City Department of Health. Um, so, uh, next slide. So what does this all mean? To, what does this mean to you all? So there, you know, initially there was there was concern uh, within the public health world because we were not even able to share necessarily some of this data with with our internal agency partners due to uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid CMS guidelines. Um, you know, we're all we're all highly regulated. CLEP in New York State, CLIA in the rest of the nation. Um, so there was uh, recently. Uh, CMS is exercising enforcement discretion. So this now allows us to share the, the labs to share the, our data public with our own public health departments for public health purposes. It, it does not allow us to share the data back with uh, the providers, the submitters. And part of this is, is because the, these assays have not been clinically validated. So one of the things that I mentioned a little bit earlier is this with this pangolin. So Pangolin is, you know, an international consortium of software scientists, and so they're not really as interested in CLIA and CLEP regulations as we are. So when they update their software on a regular ad hoc basis, they will reassign lineage names. So you can imagine if we reported you, you know, a patient with a lineage 526, and then we came back to you two weeks later and said, no, no, this has been changed to 437. So when there are cases of WGS being used for clinical purposes, but these are in what we call lockdown pipelines that are not changed. And if they are, they have to they have to be revalidated. Next slide. Um, so the study of the variants is just a little bit about what we read in the news. So we, we see that there's, you know, there's also been an explosion in publication. And on the lower right, you see this med archive and there's bio archive. So these are non-peer reviewed uh, articles and many of them will be eventually peer reviewed, but many of them will not. So there is, you know, the science is usually pretty good, but these are, you know, a way for scientists to get their name out there very quickly. So they should be taken with somewhat of a grain of salt, but they are again, you know, the interest now is to get information out quickly and then we'll sort through it as, as more information comes out. So a lot of these studies that are done in the lab or these neutralization studies, they, they take a, 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 an engineered construct, they put the spike gene into a, a, a non-replicating virus, uh, seen in this rather complicated diagram to the right, and then they see how much of the reporter gene gets into a cell, and they can say based on 
X, Y, or Z antibody or monoclonal or convalescent or vaccinesera, how much of the entry is, is inhibited? So that's, they'll say, with convalescent sera, with a particular mutation, you may see a six-fold reduction in, um, in neutralization mm -hmm. ability. And so, like I said, these are artificial constructs, and they don't represent an actual infection by SARS, in, in a, and certainly don't represent the, the immune response in total. But they can be useful for quickly learning and new information on regarding the effectiveness of therapeutics. So there are recently a report on some of the Regeneron monoclonals that, at least in the laboratory setting, are, are less effective against uh, certain, certain lineages with certain mutations. So this is important that if you have a dominant lineage in a region, that there may be a, you know discussions about limiting the, the use of particular anti uh, say monoclonal cocktails. Um, and more recently, there's rather large studies going on now throughout the world, but there you know we're now starting to get more data with regard to uh, you know vac vaccine breakthrough. So there's more to come on this. Um, So really, you know, summarize, you know, as it's been said, the SARS-CoV-2 mutations will, will continue to happen, and but more real-world data is really needed to determine the impact of the mutation and the associated variants of concern, and what effect they'll have on vaccines and therapeutics. Um, the other thing to note is, as I said, WGS is costly. It's a time-consuming process. It's really not useful in making these timely clinical decisions. Maybe in the near future it will be, but at the moment it really isn't. Um, and as I said, these results are not reportable unless the process is you know, CLEP or CLIA validated. Um, but whole genome sequence does allow us for ongoing tracking of how the virus evolves. And you know, the information that can be gained is used to inform public health decisions, treatment with specific therapeutics, and vaccine design. And of course, uh, the next slide, uh, none of this work would have been possible without an army of people that were you know, all doing different roles and you know, working day and night uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Hello. Are you, should I go now? This is Annie. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, please, Dr. Fine. Okay, thank you. Um, we're very excited for your presentation. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, um, and what I'm going to uh, talk about, it really, um, leads uh, very nicely off of what um, Scott just presented about variant um, science of, of all these variants circulating globally and in New York City. So you can go to the next slide. I'm going to talk about the epidemiology of these variants so far. <clears throat> so, um, as, and I'm going to skip through some things that, that um, repeat some of what Scott just presented. So the variants that we are most concerned about in New York City right now uh, include B117, which is a variant of concern and is known to be more transmissible and to cause more severe disease. Um, also B1526, which is the predominant variant in New York City right now, although it has stabilized over the last few weeks. And that is classified as a variant of interest and um, may be more transmissible. There's no definitive evidence of this yet, except for its, uh, its rapid rise. The rapid rise may be due to um, it having taken advantage of certain um, transmission opportunities, super spreader events, or it could be more transmissible. We still don't know for sure. And then um, we don't know yet whether it causes more severe disease. That is under study right now, and I'm going to go into that a bit, um, And nor whether it evades immunity to a previous infection or um, induced by vaccination. Um, but both of those concerns have been raised by um, in vitro studies, which are what uh, Scott was just talking about in the laboratory, decreased um, neutralization by antibodies of these variants of the B1526, um, especially with the E484K mutation, which is a subclade of that lineage. And then uh, lastly, P1, which has been going up more recently and is now um, actually rap rising rather rapidly to about 2% of all the variants that have been circulating. Um, and this one is also a variant of concern, um, has been shown to be more transmissible and also may evade immunity. Next slide. So um, what we do here in New York City um, is um, we are basically um, taking data that are hopefully relatively randomly selected um, in and hopefully representative of 
the New York City population um, that is um, has COVID-19. And the way that we do that is um, there are um, since uh, October 2020, uh, we all the SARS-CoV-2 isolates that have been received by the public health laboratory that meet technical criteria, which include a cycle threshold of under 31, I believe, though Scott can collect, correct me if that's not correct, um, they have undergone whole genome sequencing at our public health lab. So um, that's been um, extremely helpful, and um, the public health laboratory receives specimens from nine rapid express testing sites, otherwise known as Quickie Labs, um, also from a few from shelters for unhoused persons and another um, set of specimens from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. And then in addition to that, we have specimens that are submitted to the Pandemic Response Laboratory, which since um, February was ramped up quite quickly to be now sequencing a fairly large volume of specimens that meet their technical criteria. And those specimens come from um, health and hospitals, outpatient sites, some inpatient sites, some mobile vans, and some emergency department admissions. <clears throat> um, and we have looked at both of those sources, the public health laboratory and the pandemic response lab to see how representative they are of New York City cases in general. And they do tend, they do represent New York City fairly well. There are a few exceptions. It tends to be a younger population. It tends to be a slightly less acutely ill population, but it covers the five boroughs. It covers the age groups. And so um, the, this set of specimens that are um, randomly selected at the pandemic response lab and all um, specimens tested at the, submitted and diagnosed at the public health lab are um, sent to the, the surveillance group, which is where I work, and we match it back to our um, surveillance database to try to understand the epidemiologic and clinical characteristics of these patients and to be able to examine the different variants. So together, all these isolates that undergo sampling and sequencing at PHL or PRL are still a very small proportion of all confirmed cases in New York City. I'm gonna show you a figure about that. But in recent weeks, it's about six to seven percent of all cases in New York City. Next slide. So this is a slide you can see of the total cases in New York City. We're still sequencing a very small percentage, um, about 3.2 percent overall um, since January. But in recent weeks, this has gone up to about six percent, which is a much better sample, and we do believe it's relatively representative. Next slide. So um, this is very similar to uh, graphics that Scott showed, and um, you can see that um, here on the left is are the proportions of different variants that have been found in this sample, which is just from the PHL or from the Pandemic Response Laboratory. And you can see the rapid rise of B117 in the purple. The dark green is the B1526, our New York City variant with the E484K mutation, which is a mutation of concern because of its in vitro pop, uh, properties. And then um, the lighter green is the B1526 without the E484K mutation, and then smaller numbers of all the other variants. And on the right, you can just see a, a line for each individual variant um, with the gray line being what was formerly known as maybe wild type or other. These are all the other sequences, the ones that were circulating more widely before have declined substantially. And you can see the rise of B117 um, and the other viruses that we're talking about today. Next slide. Um, so really, as I mentioned, what we're trying to do is to integrate these data from whole genome sequencing with epidemiologic data so that we can make sense. Do these variants tend to cause more severe disease? Do they cause vaccine breakthrough? Do they cause reinfection? Do they cause um, infection among people who have been previously seropositive? For, um, and so what we're doing in order to do that is to match the data back to our surveillance database. And then we also match our surveillance database with the citywide immunization registry, as well as with the death registry. And these are done regularly. Um, there are lags in all of the data, and because of the small number of sequenced viruses, we can't make really firm conclusions just now, but we are actively working on doing this and updating our data every week. Um, so uh, we are looking at things like the severity of outcome, 
We're looking at the secondary attack rate among close contacts and also across the different variants. And um, we all these studies, as I mentioned, are ongoing. Next slide. So a quick summary just of P1, um, because that is rising dramatically here and is of concern, even though right now it's only a little bit above 2% of all variants being identified. Um, so, so far we've got about 66 P1 isolates that have been identified in New York City among New York City residents since the beginning of January. And among those two were possible reinfections, um, which means the first positive was more than 90 days prior to the um, sequenced P1 specimen collection. And then um, none of these 66 had previous shown, known antibody positivity, nor were any of them full or partial vaccine breakthroughs. None had received a full uh, dose of vaccine um, and then gone two weeks afterwards to generate vaccine immunity. Two of the P of the P1 cases had been hospitalized and there have been no deaths. The age breakdown is mostly in the adult, young adult and young adult age group. Pretty similar to what we're seeing citywide. Next slide. And then these are just some maps that show the proportion of sequenced cases by selected variants. So for example, of all uh, sequenced uh, viruses, what proportion were B1526 on the left? Oh, geographically across all the um, MODZIC does in New York City, the zip codes. And you can see that B1526 is really spread fairly widely through the city, but is more concentrated in the Bronx and then in some parts of Queens. And then um, uh, B117 on the right, um, the darker colors have the higher proportion of B117, and those it's also spread pretty widely through the city. And I think that might be my... Last slide. Oh, just one, just a summary slide. So, and overall, we know the number of variants of interest and concern are increasing in New York City, um, and an increasing proportion are variants of concern. We're actually up to about 80% now. Um, B117 is increasingly common and probably expected to become more dominant in the coming weeks. B152, this should say six, sorry, that's a typo. It's also common, but stabilized, and P1 is rare, but increasing. It's really too early for us to know how these variants will impact reinfection or vaccine effectiveness, but these are important questions, and I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry for going so close to the end. This is a huge team that worked on this, too, so thanks to all my collaborators. Yes, thanks to uh, you, Dr. Fine, and thanks to everybody else. Um, who was acknowledged in both presentations. Uh, I'm gonna try to do one question from each topic because uh, because we have we don't have too much time for questions, but I know these are these are very interesting questions. Um, Dr. Zucker, can you uh, very quickly walk through what a healthcare provider should do if a patient comes and says, uh, I just got the uh, J and J Janssen vaccine um, a week ago, and I am worried that I might have symptoms of a clot. Oh, Dr. Zucker or Dr. Crouch? Oh, sorry, I was I was on mute. Um, so I, I am aware that there have been um, a lot of people who um, have been calling their providers um, and have been worried. You know, it's, I think the medical provider needs to take a careful history and do a medical exam and, and make a determination whether there's anything that's worrisome. If not, they need to reassure the patient. Um, again, the risk of the CVSC after the J&J vaccine is very low. Um, and obviously, if there are any worrisome symptoms, they need to, um, you know, send them into, you know, the emergency department for an assessment. Over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Zucker. And um, I guess we have uh, one more for you quickly, Dr. Zucker. How can providers encourage their patients to get the vaccine if they have not already? 
Yeah. So what I would suggest is in the interest of time, we have a lot of uh, materials on our website to in, about how to talk to patients about the vaccine um, and, you know, some good talking points to guide you through that. You know, I think we need to focus on the um, safety record of the vaccines and the effectiveness of the vaccines, as well as the severity of COVID infection. But I think that that's something that um, I would recommend we can send the link out when um, the slides go out after this or when a notice about them being posted. So there's a lot of content on our website um, to help providers with this. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zucker. And Dr. Fine, we had some questions about, uh, we had some questions about breakthrough, uh, vaccine breakthroughs in COVID infections and uh, what we know about that in New York City. Well, um, I, you know, Dr. Zucker could also answer this question. What we know is that um, no vaccine is 100% effective, so we do expect to see vaccine breakthroughs in a population as large as the one that's being vaccinated in New York City. So a vaccine breakthrough is defined as a positive test for COVID by either antigen or by nucleic acid amplification test at least two weeks following completion of a valid FDA-approved uh, or whatever the phrases, um, vaccination, course of vaccination for COVID. So, um, so we are seeing them. We are seeing um, vaccine breakthroughs reported, not unexpectedly. We're trying to quantify them by matching our surveillance data with the citywide immunization registry. And we are investigating them to understand more about who is having vaccine breakthrough, how symptomatic, how many, what proportion are symptomatic, what proportion uh, might be hospitalized or have a worse outcome, but I, we don't have any um, conclusive findings to date, just to say that they are happening and we are not surprised about that. Thank you, Dr. Fine. And since we are over time, I'll do, I'll do one more quick question, uh, which is for Dr. Hughes about, um, you know, is there a test that we have to look at, you know, where we can test whether the vaccine is effective or whether someone is immune to COVID? Uh, the short answer is not really. Um, again, you know, these are all done in laboratory studies, so um, it's just really going to be collecting the data over time to see what bears out. I don't know if my colleagues want to add anything to that. All right. I think um, I no. I think that. Oh, sorry. Did we want to add more? Um, I think that is. Uh, we are three minutes over. So thank you everyone for joining us today. That was a, a bunch of really, really excellent presentations. Uh, as a reminder, the webinar will be available on our provider webpage if you go to nyc.gov slash health slash coronavirus and go to the section for providers. Uh, there's a lot of good information there. At the bottom, there is a section for webinars and the slides and the video of this presentation will be available. Um, Allie, when is the next one of these? Uh, our next webinar will be in four weeks on Friday. That should be May 14th. It'll be from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, and the link for registration will be up on the website that Dr. Ridges referenced. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.